You and your partner are the CEOs of your family, and you need to make the decision that works best for your unique situation. Whoever thought making a baby could be so hard? Luckily, the fertility journey isn't meant to be traveled alone. Eloise Drain has helped hundreds of people build and grow their families over the last 15 years, and she's ready to share her insider knowledge and expertise with you. So grab a seat and let's talk fertility and alternative family building in the Fertility Cafe. Hello, and welcome to the Fertility Cafe. I'm your host, Eloise Drain. Today, we're talking about two of the most common paths to modern family building, adoption and surrogacy. In the 12 years I've been running my surrogacy agency, one of the most common questions that a potential intended parent asks often is, what's the difference between adoption and surrogacy? A common misconception is that adoption and surrogacy are the same thing, which I can tell you, they are not. Today, I'll share my thoughts about each path and what you'll want to consider plan for, and think through before navigating each one. In no way is this podcast all-inclusive, covering every single aspect of both surrogacy and adoption. Instead, it's a starting point to help with your decision-making process and a thought starter to think through the pros and cons of each scenario. Should you like a deeper dive into the surrogacy process, I recommend listening to Episode 2, Surrogacy 101, and in the coming weeks, I'll be sharing on the intricacies of adoption. The best recommendation I can give you is you must make the decision that is best for you, not for your extended family or friends or anyone else who wants to give their two cents. You and your partner are the CEOs of your family, and you need to make the decision that works best for your unique situation. As you've traveled the path of infertility or modern family building, I can guarantee you've heard your fair share of opinions, and hopefully you've developed a thick skin through this process. You've heard every tip, trick, and piece of advice known to man. But let's be honest, if they worked, you wouldn't be here listening to me right now. While most people have the best of intentions in sharing their thoughts, remember that it's your journey to parenthood. You will be the one raising this child into adulthood. You are the decision maker, and any decision you make is okay. That's the beautiful thing about modern family building. There are so many different paths that can lead you to the same destination of parenthood. At this point in your journey, it may look like you are at a fork in the road and you have two options, adoption or surrogacy. But neither path is a straight shot to parenthood. They will bend and twist and overlap at times and may even have additional forks and sharp turns along the way. Both are certainly great options for growing your family and should be considered in depth before you make a final decision. I believe surrogacy is a beautiful thing, and as a three-time surrogate, I experienced the process firsthand. Yet I know for a fact that surrogacy is not for everyone. Adoption is an equally beautiful and a fulfilling path to parenthood. Both options have their pros and cons and unique emotional, legal, and financial considerations. Let's walk through some of the biggest differences between the two to help you get a better feel for why surrogacy and adoption are different and which may be a better option for you. Parenthood is an emotional process, period. No matter how you go about growing your family, you are investing every ounce of your heart and soul into the process, and the emotional components and considerations can't be minimized or overlooked. As an intended parent that is choosing between adoption and surrogacy, it's safe to assume that a lot of decisions have been taken out of your control thus far. Maybe it was a surprising medical diagnosis that robbed you from your fertility such as endometriosis or uterine fibroids, or a health battle you never dreamed you'd have to face like cancer, or maybe it was a past pregnancy that ended with devastating consequences and left you unable to carry again. And for others of you listening, those of you in the LGBTQ community, for example, you've known all your life that you would need to make the choice between adoption and surrogacy one day if you wanted to start a family. No matter what your story is, I know it's been an emotional one. There are numerous factors you'll need to consider when deciding which will be the best path for you to complete your family. Neither option is an easy slam dunk, and anyone who tells you that it is, is probably selling you something. Probably the biggest worry I hear expressed about either option is, what if this doesn't work? What if after trying everything and becoming emotionally invested in the prospect of becoming a parent to a child via adoption or surrogacy, something falls through? I'll be honest. You do need to be fully aware of and prepared for the possibility of loss or complications. With surrogacy, there is the possibility that your surrogate won't get pregnant right away or that she may suffer a miscarriage. 
The long journey from finding a surrogate to having a successful cycle to navigating a healthy pregnancy can be, well, exhausting and emotionally draining. Adoption is also an emotional roller coaster. If you're hoping to adopt a newborn baby, chances are you'll be waiting a very long time. It could take several years, in fact. In most cases, you'll work with an adoption agency to get chosen by a birth mother. When you do get chosen, you still run the risk of the birth mom changing her mind at the last minute. I know of multiple people who had the nursery decorated, the name chosen, the onesies folded just so, only to be crushed by a last-minute change of heart. All of this to say, the path to parenthood is fraught with emotion, and there is often a lot of heartbreak along the way, no matter which direction you choose. I will say, surrogacy does remove a significant amount of uncertainty. I'll talk more about the legal side of things later, but for now, let's consider it in terms of the emotional impact. In a surrogacy arrangement, there is a legal contract in place that helps all parties manage expectations, and to a large degree, emotions. A potential surrogate will always undergo a psychological evaluation by a mental health professional before committing to the process. Intended parents are also encouraged to get, at the very least, an initial round of counseling. It's best practice to receive regular counseling throughout the process, including sessions with the surrogate if possible. The surrogacy contract also serves to manage expectations about the type of relationship and communication you'll have with one another. Again, I'll talk more about this later, but for now, suffice it to say that some people view surrogacy as slightly less risky when it comes to potential emotional fallout. Much of that boils down to the fact that in surrogacy, all parties enter the arrangement willingly and with full knowledge of the process involved. The same can't be said for adoption in most cases, since birth mothers don't get pregnant with the sole intent being to put the baby up for adoption. Most women who make that decision do so after coming to terms with unexpected circumstances. Some of the victims of sexual assault. Others may suffer from economic hardship or other personal challenges. Others feel they're too young, unprepared, or unwilling to raise a child. And so generally speaking, when a woman chooses to place her child up for adoption, the process is already beginning from a place of emotional volatility. In the case of surrogacy, all parties enter the process willingly and after a lot of preparation. With adoption, there's no way to account for or control whether or not the birth mother receives any sort of counseling. If she has help from a social worker or agency, she will likely be offered mental health services, but it's her prerogative if she chooses to move forward with it. As I'm sure you can imagine, a birth mother's entire journey can be filled with doubt, sadness, anger, and a whole array of emotions, and so last-minute changes of heart or hastily made decisions can happen. Because in all reality, the birth mother has the absolute right to change her mind after the baby is born. We'll touch on this more in detail later on in the episode, but it bears emphasizing as we talk through the emotional implications of adoption. While you, as the intended parent, have a very real emotional investment in adopting a child, I'm sure you can appreciate how heart-wrenching and emotionally complicated it is for a woman to give up her child. It's a decision that should never be taken lightly, and so while it's extremely important that birth mothers have the right to change their minds, it makes for a potentially tumultuous experience for you as the intended parent. Regardless of which path you decide to pursue on your journey to parenthood, you must be aware that there will be a myriad of emotions you will need to process through. Each choice will bring a variety of feelings, taking you from joy to frustration to sadness to excitement, all in the same day sometimes. And I really cannot emphasize enough, taking care of your own mental health, whichever path you choose, is of the utmost importance. So be sure to find a counselor or therapist who you trust and with whom you and your partner, if you have one, can process the ups and downs of your journey. The most obvious consideration when it comes to adoption versus surrogacy and why someone may choose one over the other is genetics. How important is it to you to have a genetically related child? Remember, there is no right or wrong answer here. For some, they couldn't care less about the genetics. Parenthood doesn't require matching DNA. For others, it's not only important, but a critical component to parenthood in their minds. Both thought patterns are valid, and it really comes down to your personal preference. How much do genetics really influence a child's demeanor, talents, achievements, and life path? That's a debate as old as time, 
often referred to as nurture versus nature. What aspects of a personality are influenced by your genetics and DNA? And what is determined by outside influences, experiences, and unique personal perspectives? We all have seen children that are a little clones of their mom or dad, from their appearance to how they walk, talk, and behave. And then there are other children that you know are genetically related but are complete opposites from their parents in every way. The surrogacy process allows one or both intended parents to be genetically related to the child. This makes surrogacy a popular choice for intended parents who feel strongly about maintaining a genetic link to their child. Having a genetic connection can also simplify the legal process in some states. It can also be a negative for some people, though. Some people may feel uncomfortable at the thought of one parent have a genetic connection, but the other being unrelated. I hear this concern from some same-sex couples I work with especially. Another major factor to consider here is known versus unknown when it comes to a child's medical and hereditary history. As an intended parent, you, of course, want to have a healthy, happy baby. With an adoption, the birth mother can choose what, if any, family or personal health history she reveals. She's also under no legal obligation to refrain from risky behaviors while pregnant. It's up to her to self-disclose any of that information, and it's also her decision whether to receive proper prenatal care or not. With surrogacy, you enter into a legally binding agreement in which the gestational carrier agrees to be as healthy as possible while carrying your baby. Add to that fact that she will also have undergone extensive health and background checks, and you can have a large degree of confidence that your baby will get a healthy start to life. In terms of genetics and health history, many people choose surrogacy because it feels safer to have more control over the egg and sperm being used. If you use your own genetic material, or that of your partner, you obviously have direct knowledge of any hereditary health issues. Donor material is also routinely, routinely tested and screened for potential issues, so that can be a reason for some intended parents to choose surrogacy over adoption. Every coin has two sides, though, so what is an advantage for some is also a deal-breaker for others who may view this as playing God or creating designer babies with hand-selected genetic material. And so it bears repeating, this decision is yours, and yours alone, based on your unique circumstances, values, and beliefs. If you choose to proceed with surrogacy, an important piece of the puzzle will be the embryos. And I can guarantee you will hear these words from someone along the way, and you may have already heard them, unfortunately. Why would you create new life when there are so many babies out in the world waiting to be adopted? <sighs> Sorry. It's hard to hide my disgust with this statement. For one, it's extremely judgmental and leads me back to my original point. This is your choice. Any path to parenthood is okay. So don't let people's opinions hold you back. The truth is, there are not thousands of babies warehoused somewhere in the United States waiting to be adopted. The process for finding a newborn baby available for adoption is arduous and time-consuming. Internationally, there may be more infants available for adoption, but international adoptions present a whole other host of issues, especially in today's reality of travel restrictions and closed borders. Another common narrative about adoption revolves around child protective services agencies. Each state in the U.S. has a department focused on child welfare and family services. Here in Georgia, we refer to it as the Department of Family and Children's Services, or DFCS. Other states may call it Child Protective Services, or CPS, or a host of other names. This state-run department is frequently viewed by outsiders as a viable option for intended parents looking to adopt. Unfortunately, this isn't always accurate. A state's Child and Family Welfare Department is not an adoption agency. It is a program designed to protect and serve children and families in need, with the ultimate goal of keeping families together, not putting children up for adoption. The number one goal of these agencies is to assist families in creating healthy, strong, and safe environments where everyone can thrive. If a child is removed from his or her parents by child welfare, they aren't immediately placed for adoption, not by a long shot. The agency works to put the child in a temporary safe place, a foster home, while they work with the parents to solve the issues, if at all possible. Only after months and maybe even years of failed attempts to solve the familial issues and reunify the family under one roof can the parental rights be terminated by the court. At that point, and not until then, the child is put up for adoption. 
Sometimes, foster parents end up adopting the children they fostered, but it's not a guarantee. Once a child is officially in the state's care and available for adoption, when possible, extended families are the first contact for a prospective adoptive family, even before the foster family. If the extended family is unavailable, only then is the foster family given the first option to adopt. When the foster family doesn't want to adopt, then other families who are not foster parents are contacted. Your state's child welfare system should not be viewed as a path to adoption. If you do choose to become a foster parent in the hopes it will lead to an op- adoption of the child, you must be willing to accept the emotional risk with the possibility of the child returning to the biological parents or another biologically related family member. Intended parents looking to adopt domestically don't go looking for babies. They have to locate and connect with birth mothers first. This can be done through an agency or independently, similar to surrogacy, where intended parents contract with an agency to match them with a birth mother or attempt to locate a birth mother on their own through Facebook groups, matching pages, or with the help of friends and family and word of mouth. Let's dig a little deeper into the difference between a birth mother and a gestational carrier and the emotional considerations you will need to think through with each. The most obvious difference, and honestly most emotionally charged consideration, between a birth mother and a gestational carrier is the genetic relationship to the baby. For birth mothers, the child they are carrying is their genetic child, not a donor embryo implanted via IVF, as with gestational surrogacy. You may be thinking, what's the big deal? A woman putting her baby up for adoption doesn't want him or her, and that's why she's giving it up for adoption. Obviously, it's always more complicated than that. There is a reason why traditional surrogacy has become a taboo and uncommon practice over the last few decades. The bond between a birth mother and her baby, whether planned or unplanned, is complicated. Women facing unplanned pregnancies often have more complicated emotions to process and different factors to consider than gestational surrogates. The bonding that takes place when a woman is carrying her own genetic child is not something that can always be controlled. It can happen whether she wants it to or not. In traditional surrogacy, a woman willingly volunteers to carry a child for another person or couple and knowingly offers to use her own eggs in the process. She knows what she's getting into from moment one. Yes, she'd be carrying this baby, but the intention was never for her to keep it and raise it as her own. Then the hormones kick in, and nature kicks in, and things can get complicated. Gestational surrogacy, where there is no genetic relationship between the child and the carrier, avoids the emotional and uncontrollable bond that develops between a genetically related mother and child. Even in a traditional surrogacy where everyone knows what they were signing up for from the very beginning, things can still go awry. You can only imagine the emotional factors for a birth mother who never intended to conceive and then give the baby up for adoption. And it's not just about the birth mother in adoptions. There's also a birth father. He may or may not be involved, but if he is aware of the pregnancy, he will be involved in the adoption process. I'll explore this a little further later on, but from an emotional perspective, just know that in adoptions, you are dealing with potentially two genetic parents and the emotions of both. Another difference between surrogates and birth mothers is the medical and psychological screening process involved. Like intended parents, surrogates must undergo a thorough medical screening before they can be matched to prospective intended parents. Throughout this process, drug and alcohol use is ruled out, and intended parents can be assured that the baby will not be exposed to any harmful substances in utero. The legal contracts signed by the prospective surrogate and intended parents often also include provisions to ensure the surrogate is receiving proper prenatal care. In adoption, birth mother screening is often less thorough. By the time intended parents get involved, there is already a baby on the way. Therefore, any pre-screening is a mute point. Pregnant women considering adoption are typically asked to self-disclose any drug or alcohol use, along with their social and medical history, and they may or may not choose to receive prenatal care. Sometimes, the birth mother doesn't realize she's pregnant until several months into gestation. If she had no idea she was even pregnant until late first or even into the second trimester, she would have not known to refrain from risks. Illegal substances, tobacco, and alcohol aside, serious medical problems can arise from taking certain prescription medications or eating certain foods during a pregnancy. This is a far cry from how a gestational surrogate approaches pregnancy. 
at every step of the way, the gestational surrogate is choosing this path. She is volunteering and understands what she is getting herself into. One major requirement for a woman to become a gestational surrogate is that she has had to have successful full-term pregnancies in the past and that she is raising her own children. She knows what to expect and how to have a healthy pregnancy. Can medical complications still pop up? Of course, but they are far less likely with a gestational surrogate. Another major difference to consider is the level of control you, as the intended parent, have over the process. In adoption, adoptive parents generally get to choose certain criteria about the types of adoption situations they are open to, including race, substance exposure, medical history, and post-placement contact. However, it is ultimately the birth mother who drives the car here. It is up to her to choose the family with whom she wants to place her baby. How you match with the birth mother depends on the route you take. In a typical agency adoption, birth mothers are able to browse portfolios and profiles of potential adoptive parents. They can then select a family that feels like the right fit to them. The surrogacy matching process tends to be more mutual and personal. In surrogacy, both parties will have an opportunity to pick from profiles of whose plans, lifestyles, and expectations match their own. At first, this sounds very sim similar to the adoption matching process I just described, but there's an important difference. Each party must express their mutual interest or not. They can determine if the match feels like a good fit. Then, the surrogate and the intended parents will have the opportunity to get to know each other before moving forward. This arrangement can feel more equal and less one-sided. The time frame for matching for adoption or surrogacy can vary greatly. Both can take months, sometimes even more than a year, to find the right match. But has anything in your journey to parenthood been quick? Unfortunately, probably no. Adding more restrictive criteria, such as location and race, into the search process may extend the timeline even further. In general, there tends to be more women interested in surrogacy than there are birth mothers considering adoption, so the wait time tends to be somewhat shorter for surrogacy. There is also a limitation if race is a consideration as well. If someone is looking for a child that is of a specific race, this will limit their adoption pool. Whereas the gestational surrogacy, it's irrelevant. Have you thought about what type of relationship you like to have with the woman carrying your child, both before, during, and after the birth? The experience will be very different depending on if you choose adoption or surrogacy. Adoptive parents have little control in the adoption process, and depending on their circumstances and relationship with the expectant mother, they may not be involved in most of the pregnancy. Birth mothers may request some form of post-placement contact after adoption, either in an open or semi-open adoption arrangement, to see how the child grows and develops. While most surrogates want to stay in touch with the intended parents, the desire is typically not as strong as it is for the birth parents who have placed a biological child for adoption. In the United States these days, open or semi-open adoptions are more common than closed arrangements. Open adoption means that the birth mother and adoptive parents will stay in contact to some degree, perhaps meeting up regularly to interact with the child. Closed adoptions are less common than they were a few decades ago, but they do still happen. In these cases, the birth mother and adoptive parents never meet, and the identity of the birth parents is not shared with the adoptive parents. Again, it is the birth mom who runs the show and gets to decide here for the most part. She gets to decide if the adoption will be open or closed. Of course, as an intended parent, you can choose to only accept one or the other. That does further limit your options, however, and it may make your wait even longer. The name of the game with surrogacy, on the other hand, is mutual agreement. In surrogacy, you have a legal contract in place that clearly outlines each party's expectations and relationship to the baby from the very beginning. Because this legal agreement is negotiated and signed ahead of the medical surrogacy process, there is never any question that the surrogate is carrying the baby for the intended parents and that she will keep herself and the baby healthy during the pregnancy. A surrogacy contract will also outline the boundaries and expectations for the relationship moving forward. How often will the surrogate and intended parents be in contact throughout the pregnancy? Will the intended parents be present for any prenatal appointments? Will they get weekly text updates or bump pictures? How about after the baby is born? All parties will agree on how much, if any, contact there is after the birth. Some things in the process can be more controlled than others, 
which brings me to the legal considerations of surrogacy versus adoption. Both adoption and surrogacy have extensive legal processes involved in securing the parental rights of the intended parents to the child. The laws, statutes, and requirements will vary state by state. But I'd like to touch on the general points you'll need to consider when deciding between adoption and surrogacy. In surrogacy, intended parents can be legally recognized as their child's parents before birth with a pre-birth order, creating zero risk of a gestational surrogate taking custody of the child as she revokes all assumed or actual parental rights before the child is born. Legal contracts such as the gestational surrogacy agreement lays out all intentions, responsibilities, and expectations before the child is ever conceived. Some states may require a post-birth order or a second parent adoption in the case of donor uh, gametes. In adoption, the majority of the legal process takes place after the birth of the child. Contracts regarding intent to adopt can be executed between the birth parents and the adopted parents, but it is only after the birth that the birth mother and father will execute written consent to the adoption and the process to legally terminate their parental rights begins. Some states have a streamlined adoption process, but others require extensive filings and the process to finalizing the adoption can take many months. One of the biggest legal concerns when it comes to adoption is the birth mother's right to revoke. When a woman consents to the adoption of her child in the United States, she has the legal right to revoke this decision and retain all parental rights to her child. The adoption then becomes null and void, and the intended parents must return the child to his or her birth mother immediately. The time frame for the right to revoke varies among states, ranging anywhere from hours to days to months. Some states require claims of duress or fraud to allow a revocation, but other states have no threshold to revoke the consent to adopt except for the birth mother's change of heart. As you can imagine, the time frame in which the birth mother can revoke her consent to the adoption is an extremely high-stress, highly emotional time period for adoptive parents. It's a common myth that one option is wildly more expensive than the other. But the answer you get always seems to depend on who you're talking to. The reality is that both options require a significant investment. When it's all said and done, surrogacy is still going to be costlier than private domestic adoption, averaging around $100,000 or more. A lot of that cost will be from the medical procedures of surrogacy, like fertility medications, embryo transfers, and the cost of the surrogate's pregnancy. How much you spend on the medical aspect will depend on how long it takes for your surrogate to become pregnant and other variables. In addition to covering the cost of pregnancy-related expenses, your total costs will include your surrogate's compensation. While it can be more affordable than surrogacy, adoption can still be costly, averaging about $50,000 or more. Like surrogacy, you'll still be responsible for the pregnancy-related costs. The primary variables that affect the total cost of the adoption are the financial needs and situation of the expectant mother, which vary with each woman. Does she just need help with medical expenses, or does she also maybe need help affording her rent and transportation to and from appointments throughout the pregnancy? The total cost of a domestic private adoption may include an application fee, the agency fee, a home visit, and background checks of all parties involved, the birth mother's expenses, each state has limits on how much you can pay, medical expenses, and insurance, travel to the to and from where the birth mother lives, and the cost to legally terminate the rights of the birth mother and father, if applicable. With both adoption and surrogacy, there are financing options available. However, there are additional grants and tax credits available for adoption, including a federal tax credit. Some intended parents may be able to claim the cost of IVF or other medical treatments if they're using their own egg and or sperm, but that is dependent on their specific st state tax situation, and it's not a guarantee. I want to mention another option for parenthood aside from adoption and surrogacy. Becoming a foster parent can be extremely fulfilling for the person who has the right heart. Foster children are kids who have been removed from their parents' home for a variety of reasons. It could be due to abuse of some kind, physical, emotional, or sexual. They may suffer from neglect or abandonment, or their parent may be struggling with substance abuse, mental illness, or another issue that keeps them from caring for their children properly. I mentioned earlier that some people view foster parenting as a means to their desired end of adoption. But the problem with that is that the goal of our foster system is to reunite kids with their families. Termination of parental rights is always a last resort. But as the parents work with the court system and social workers to fix whatever issues there are, 
those children need somewhere to go. That's where foster parents come in. As you consider your options for parenthood, you may want to keep this option on your radar. Because remember, there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to modern family building. One thing to know, there are no guarantees either way. I've recently seen ads from IVF clinics that boast guaranteed baby. And I'm sure people have said to you more than once about both surrogacy and adoption that you'll finally have the baby you dreamed of, guaranteed. I wish I could sit here and tell you that one option can guarantee a baby more so than the other, but it's just not true. Neither is a more surefire way to starting your family over another. Ask anyone who's gone through either process and they will confirm there are no guarantees in modern family building. Ultimately, there are a lot of unknowns that you'll be faced with. You'll never be fully in control with either path and this can be difficult to accept for many hopeful families. But between adoption and surrogacy, there are different unknowns and variables to consider and may influence your decision. Now, I know I've thrown a lot of information at you, so let's take a moment to summarize the pros and cons of each family building option. In surrogacy, you'll be more in control of the process. You'll be able to mutually choose your surrogate. Surrogates have all been thoroughly screened, so you know that they have a good health history and that your surrogate will be receiving prenatal care. You can check in with your surrogate, attend appointments, and be present for the birth. Like in any pregnancy, unforeseen circumstances can arise. Variables including how the surrogate's body responds to fertility medications, the viability of your embryos, and other factors will also still be out of your hands. Ultimately, there will be some unknowns when it comes to your wait time, total cost, and depending on your situation, the potential for having a genetic relationship with your child. In adoption, prospective birth mothers are the ones who are primarily in control of the process. The prospective birth mothers can change their minds, and a woman may not have received prenatal care before connecting with an adoption professional. There are some additional unknowns you would have to be willing to accept in adoption, which can include when you would be chosen by a birth mother, if she'll ultimately decide to place her baby for adoption, and more. Up until consent is final, most decisions will be made by the birth parents. Remember, only you can decide which path is right for you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can follow Fertility Cafe on Instagram and Facebook. If you haven't yet, go to your listening platform of choice and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. We'd also love you to share Fertility Cafe with friends and family members who would benefit from the information shared. Join us next week for another conversation on alternative family building. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Eloise Drain. Remember, love has no limits. Neither should parenthood. Thank you for joining us in the Fertility Cafe. Whether you're an intended parent, a woman considering egg donation, thinking of becoming a surrogate yourself, or a friend or family member of someone dealing with infertility, we're here to help. Visit our website, thefertilitycafe.com, for resources on fertility, alternative family building, and making this journey your own.